All right, we're talking about the Olivet Discourse this morning, and we have been going through this for weeks and weeks, and I'm going to use these stools as an aid. And so we've been in Mark chapter number 13, verse 3, and then subsequent verses, and let me show you what we've been talking about. We talked about that during this period of time, there'll be deceivers everywhere, false Christ. We said that during this time, there would be wars and rumors of wars and all kinds of chaos on the world. We said that the world would be filled with famines and natural disasters and, and things like that and troubles in your life and in my life. We said that as part of God's plan that there would be a global proclamation of the truth. That God would use the suffering of Christians to reposition them to places and locations where they could preach the gospel. We said that family members would turn against family members because of their association with Christ and some would even have others put to death. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We talked about that last week in the importance of endurance and persisting and continuing in the faith. So now this Sunday we're preaching about the abomination that causes desolation. The abomination that causes desolation. Now this is how not to preach a sermon. Don't tackle this many scriptures. Don't have this much information. This is a potential disaster for a sermon. And, and I may just, this might be a flop, just a complete flop. But I don't think that I can effectively talk about Mark 13, 14 to 20 if I don't take you back to Daniel, if I don't show you the connection to Revelation, and if I don't tell you what's in 2 Thessalonians. So whenever we get done is when we get done. <laughs> I ate some breakfast. I hope you did as well. Uh, Mark chapter number 13. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Go ahead and give a warning order to those in the nursery. And um, they need a second shift prepared. Um, verse 14. But when you, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing where it ought not... Let him that reads, let him that listens this morning, let him that's sitting in Brian Baptist Academy and in this church and everyone that will read this and study this and in your Christian school and anyone that's doing private devotions and anyone that hears these words, let them understand. These words are supposed to provoke within you action. Let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein, to take anything out of his house. Let him that is in the field, don't go back again to take up your garment. Woe to them that are pregnant, and to them that give suck in those days. Pray that your flight be not in the winter. For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. Now look at verse 20. And except the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he has shortened those days. Days. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to know, we need to know, we must know what the abomination that causes desolation is all about. It's absolutely imperative that we are educated in this regard and that we can talk intelligently about this. And then moreover, beyond talking intelligently and giving an answer for the faith that lies within us, we must recognize the significance of the warning signs and respond accordingly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, if you're a first-time visitor, or if this is your second Sunday with us, please come again. Don't judge this sermon by, oh my goodness, can't imagine that. Uh, this is an incredible subject. I'm going to do my very best to be thorough I want to make sure that I'm careful with what I present. I don't say what the Bible doesn't say. I don't want to bring in presuppositions into the text. I want to limit what I present only to what the text tells us. And I'll tell you when it's a supposition and when it's what the text says. Hopefully I, I can do a good job. 
Here's characteristic number six. The abominable actions of the Antichrist and his false prophet. The abominable actions of the Antichrist and his false prophet and all the associated followers of the Antichrist will bring God's devastating judgment, ultimate desolation upon the earth during seven years of great tribulation, also known as Jacob's trouble. All right, that's characteristic number six. That's what we're talking about this morning. The abominable actions of the Antichrist, his false prophet, their followers are going to bring about God's incredible devastation upon this earth during seven years of tribulation, Jacob's trouble. So, verse 14 says it is spoken of by the prophet Daniel. So let's turn back to Daniel chapter number 9 and let's read in our own Bibles what it says. Now in Mark... 13, let me encourage you to go ahead and mark a marginal note of Daniel 9, 24 through 27. That way you in the future can study this more clearly. Daniel chapter number 9, the last of the five major prophets. And let's draw our attention to the beginning of verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in an everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore two weeks, the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks, Messiah will be cut off but not for himself. People of the prince shall come to destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined and he shall confirm the covenant with many one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation and that are determined shall be poured upon the desolate alright so now let's start unpacking that seventy weeks are determined now notice the phraseology there are determined that very idea implies that there is an outside entity determining things. Are determined. Seventy weeks are determined. What does he mean by week? Week is a seven or a period of seven. Seven days or seven years. For example, in Genesis 29, 27, Fulfill her week and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. So a week is how long? Seven years. That's right, seven years. So now after three score and two weeks, we read in verse 25, I read it out loud to you, upon the 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, read in verse 24. Verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So I'm going to use these stools to help us get organized on this timeline. And stool number one will represent the commandment to go forth and restore the temple and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. David, you've been working on this in the Minor Prophets, right? And so you work through this whole idea right here. Jeremiah comes and rebuilds the temple. There's a, this is a period of 473 years. Stool number two right here will represent 69th week. The 69th week. So I want to insert between stool number one and stool number two. I want to drop in here 483 years. 69 weeks. 69 times 7 or 483 years. And this is now the point where I can expect to see the who? The Messiah. The Messiah comes during this period of time right here. But wait a minute. We read in the text how many weeks? 70 weeks. So there is a week out there yet to be talked about. Let me use this stool right here. 
to start the 70th week. Let's move it way over here. And this would be the beginning of the 70th week. I want to use this stool right here to represent the end of the 70th week. So let's just put these together. These two stools represent the 70th week. Stool number one is the going forth to establish or the rebuild. Stool number two is the 69th week or 483 years. Stools, these two over here are Daniel's or this 70th week. All right, that's our outline. We can work with this. We can come over here now and we understand that this is the introduction of the virgin birth of the Messiah. This is the death, the burial, resurrection. And then this is the ascension of Jesus Christ to be on the right hand of God the Father, intercede for all who believe. And this area that we're talking about from here all the way over here is what we commonly refer to as the church age or the fullness of the Gentiles. Okay, you have to kind of work through this. Just bear with me. So I believe that in verse 26 there are two subjects. There's an anointed one and there's a Messiah. The anointed one is the Messiah. And there's a prince or a ruler. And then it talks about this sacred place and this is the temple. This is the sanctuary. Making reference to the sacred one. Notice in the verse 26 the word the sanctuary. So we've got the Messiah being cut off. And then we've got something happening where the city is destroyed and the sanctuary. So what we want to know this morning, right off the bat, is has this already been fulfilled? Has this been fulfilled in the destruction that occurred in 70 AD? Or is there more to happen in the future? That's what we want to decide this morning. That's what we want to work through. We know that the text tells us that there will be a destruction of the city. The city where the sanctuary is, and that city is what? It's Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem. Now would you pause for just a moment with me and consider this idea. 2,800 years ago approximately, 2,600 somewhere around there, a man by the name of Daniel said that there would be something amazing that happened in that city. 500, 600 years later, Jesus came on the scene and told his disciples that there would be an abomination of desolation that would occur in this city. And notice how small my arrow is. I actually blew the map up very large so I could find Israel and then I've dropped the arrow in there and then I shrunk it back down to get it back on the slide. And yet, that very idea shows how this is so amazing. Israel is a tiny little spot. Just a tiny little spot. Jerusalem is even smaller. And yet, 2,000 years later, we can easily see how there would be a problem in Jerusalem. That's not a difficult concept for us to embrace today, that there would be a problem in Jerusalem. We're not wondering, how in the world would something like this happen in Jerusalem? We can easily see, we can easily see with the news, Iraq, Iran, Syria. We can easily see how there's going to be a problem in Jerusalem. We can easily see how there's a need for a ruler to come up and establish something. We can easily see how the Middle East is a source of potential problems. That's not hard for us this morning. Just imagine how difficult it would be for me to preach this text, David, if he'd picked somewhere in Iceland. And I'm telling you about an abomination of desolation that's going to occur in Iceland, and there's going to be a global conflict in Iceland. And everyone sitting here going, how in the world is that going to happen? We don't even know where Iceland is. But I can tell you Jerusalem, Israel this morning, and you immediately go, yes, I can see how that would happen. I watch the news. I know what the problems are. Or consider this idea. How many people groups do you know that are still alive today 2,800 years later? 3,000 years later. How many people groups do you know that are still holding their ground on a land and claiming it to be theirs? The significance of Israel is an apologetic for the Christian faith. The very fact that they are still a people is an apologetic to the sovereignty of God who says those are my people and I will watch over them. Matthew says that this desolation, this abomination that causes desolation will happen in the holy place. That this individual will stand in the holy place. Verse 27 says, And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to launch beyond week 69. I'd like to go on beyond the cross and the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The 
Pentecost or the introduction of the church in Acts chapter 2. I'd like to walk forward during this church age. I'd like to move your attention all the way to the end times. I'd like to launch right here onto these two stools. And I'd like this left side right here to be the beginning of seven years. And the, this side to be the end of seven years. This is one week. I want to tell you that the Bible says that in the beginning of this 70th year, standing right where I'm at, that the Antichrist is going to rise up and he's going to establish a covenant. Now, covenant is nothing more than an agreement, folks. It's an agreement. We can easily see, based on the world that we live in, we can easily see why there's going to be a need for an agreement in Israel. We can easily see why there's going to be a need for a global leader to rise up and to broker a deal between people and get in a peace agreement going on. That, that's not hard for us to conceive of. This is Daniel's 70th week. This is the week yet to be determined. This is the final culminating week right here. Beyond this, beyond this is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Beyond this is the millennial kingdom. Beyond this is the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. This is the 70th week. When this week is done, Christ comes again. The Bible says, he, he shall confirm a covenant within many for seven years. But wait a minute. In the middle of the week, in the middle of the week, seven years, let's divide it in half. In the middle of the week, each stool represents three and one half years. In the middle of the week, in the middle of it, what is he going to do? He is going to break this covenant. He's going to break it. So somewhere during these three and a half years, there's an agreement whereby at the temple in Jerusalem, they're able to sacrifice. And they like sacrificing. And it's part of their Jewish heritage. And they're sacrificing during this three and a half years. But wait a minute. In the middle of this week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to what? Cease. So he brokers a deal with the Jews so that whatever the deal includes, they'll be able to sacrifice in the temple. But three and a half years into it, he steps in and breaks the agreement. He separates the agreement. And then I was studying this verse very clearly, and I'm not positive this is right. It's nothing that I would be dogmatic about. I'd be happy to say I, I respect you. But I was looking at this verse in the NASB. And I noticed that in the New American, um, the, the New American uh, Standard Bible in 1995, that there's a little bit of difference in wording right here. Art, right, would you go back, please? All we have is a pronoun here. We have a pronoun here and a pronoun here. Both cases, just a pronoun. Now, I, know, I wanted you to notice how they say, will come one. Now, you say this morning, why in the world are you introducing this additional bit of information here? This What's going on here? Is Daniel leaving room for a false prophet here? What do you mean by false prophet? A false prophet is the religious leader of the end times who along with the dragon, the devil, and the beast, the antichrist, forms an unholy trinity in opposition to God. And the book of Revelation speaks of two beasts, the Antichrist, the political ruler, and wait a minute, there's a second beast, a religious leader inspired by Satan who deceives the world into worshiping the Antichrist. Now you say, why in the world are we talking about this? I, know, I don't see any references to the false prophet in Mark 13. The reason we want to talk about this, the reason we're going to go to Revelation 13, is we want to know if this is the 483rd year, 483rd year right here, if this is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ around 30 AD, please stay with me, I know it's a little bit complicated, but I don't know how else to explain it. If we launch forward to 70 AD right here, about 40 years later, I want to know, is this what Titus did? Is this the abomination of desolation? Or is there one to come? I want to know, is the prophecy already been fulfilled in Mark chapter 13? We saw that Titus went in, went in and destroyed the temple. We talked about that the weeks ago. Is this the fulfillment, or is there something more to come? Turn your Bibles to Revelation 13. Oh, I see the yawns out there, and I know I'm losing you. I'm sorry. You feel like you're in a history class this morning. I know. All these dates. Turn to Revelation 13. I'm going to show you why we're going to Revelation 13 in just a minute. 
I want you to notice two things out of Revelation 13. I want you to notice a reference to a false prophet. And I want you to notice these 42 months. This reference to 42 months. Alright, let's read it. And I, stood in the, and I stood upon the sand of the sea. The eye is John. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Having seven heads. Ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns. And upon his heads the name of blaspheme. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as feet of a bear. His mouth as a mouth of a lion. Dragon gave him power. And his seat and great authority. Now I need you to remember, because I'm not going to get to this until the very end of the sermon, but I need you to remember 30 minutes from now, 40 minutes from now, an hour from now, I need you to remember a leopard, I need you to remember bear, I need you to remember a lion. Alright, let's verse, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they that worshipped the dragon gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given him a mouth speaking great things, blasphemies. Power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. I'm going to walk all the way over here because I need you to see this illustration. I told you that stool number one and stool number two were combined to equal a total of one week or seven years. I told you that in the stool number one represented three and one half years or the middle of the week and stool number two represented the second three and one half years. Now three and one half years is how many months? It's 42 months. One week has been determined, one final week. God has determined one final week. And so in the middle of the middle of the, the abomination of desolation, the breaking of the covenant, rises up this description. And notice very clearly in your Bible, and power was given unto him to continue for how long? Forty and two months. You have, yes, the abomination of desolation. Yes, the week is mean. And you have 42 more months. Not 41, not 43. You have exactly 42 more weeks. All right, let's keep reading. And he opened up his mouth in blasphemy against God, the blasphemy of his name, and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given over all kindred, tongues, and nations. Sounds like a global ruler to me. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. And if any man have ear to hear, let him hear. And he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So what I want you to see here is the global ruler rises up, establishes a covenant. In the middle of that, or three and a half, one years later, he rises up, breaks the covenant, and presents himself as God. Seeking to be worshipped as God in the tabernacle. And the only people who will not worship him are those whose names are not found in the book of life. Everyone else is deceived and worships him. The second component I want you to see is this last part right here. Look on the screen, please. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as the dragon. And he exercises all power of the first beast before him. And causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. So in the process of the Antichrist, in the middle of the seven years of tribulation, breaking the covenants, there arises a false prophet. And the false prophet's intent is to motivate the world to worship the beast. This is a religious leader. This is a religious leader who encourages everyone to see the global leader as Christ. 
to see him as a being worthy of worship. You say, why in the world would anyone worship him? The Bible says, and I'll show you in a few minutes, that the signs and wonders that he does are so significant that even the elect, if it were possible, would be deceived. That's how significant it is. And when he is killed with what would be the most deadly wound and rises from the grave, resurrection of a sorts, everyone's going to say, he must be God. He must be Christ. And they're going to go after him in worship. Seven chapters later, seven chapters later, just seven chapters later, the author John makes reference to the devil, the beast, and the false prophets. You need to understand that the Bible presents that Satan desires to have an unholy trinity where he is God. That's been his plan from the very beginning. And the Antichrist is the son, and the false prophet is the equivalent of the Holy Spirit. Now, why is this so important? Why are we talking about this? Because if you go on Sermon Audio and the 500 plus sermons that are out there, folks, you are going to run across preachers that will tell you the whole shebang has been filled right here in 70 AD. And there's nothing left to happen. That it's all done. It's all occurred. And what I want to show you is that when Titus took over in 70 AD, there was no religious leader. There was no record of a religious leader encouraging that the world to worship Titus. Moreover, let me give even greater clarity, Titus went back to Rome. This beast remains in Jerusalem. Titus ruled from Rome. This beast rules from Jerusalem. Did the abomination of desolation already occur in 78 or is it yet to occur? The answer is both. What, how, what kind of answer is that? Think about how awesome this book is. Think about how awesome this... This is, this is an amazing book. Alright. I want you to consider this. These very words that Mark penned could have been read around 60 AD, 65 AD, by Christians in Jerusalem. And when they saw what was happening to Jerusalem... They would have received a warning from God to get out. Right. How awesome is that? Consider the idea that God, through his word, can warn first century Jews and first century Christians to get out. And then these same warnings can be good 2,500 or 3,000 years later. That is amazing. Maybe, maybe I didn't explain that very well, so let's go over it one more time. <laughs> Death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ascension of Jesus Christ. Now it's time for Rome to come in and destroy, destroy Jerusalem. I have heard Jesus say this, or I have read Matthew, or Mark, or Luke, and I see that in these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, a promise of an abomination of desolation occurs, and that from Mark 13, if I see these kind of things happening, I am to get out of Jerusalem. And everyone that flees out of Jerusalem is saved from the physical destruction that occurs. And so warnings that Christ gave while he was on this earth, preserved by Matthew, Mark, or Luke, in the word of God, serve as an effective heads up, get out of Jerusalem, a destruction is coming, and then wait a minute... X number of years later, those same words can be just as applicable to an entirely new generation of people. And they can heed those same kind of words and also be saved from an impending destruction. Now, someone nice and loud tell me, why do you give a warning? Why does anyone give a warning? All right, what is the motive behind giving a warning? Love. Love's the warning. Love's the motive. Look, if I don't love you, and there's a big hole, and I see you walk on there, I'm going to laugh when you fall in the hole. Because I don't love you. And I think you got it coming to you. And so I'm going to enjoy seeing you trip. But if you're my wife, and I'm bananas about you, and there's only one that fits that category, then I'm going to say, get it, watch out, hey, watch out, 
and I'm going to do everything I can to keep her from falling in the hole. So I want you to see this morning the great love of our God who says, let me tell you what the future holds because I don't want you to go into the future blind when you see these things happening. Watch out. Watch out. And I, with my eyes, can see the conditions being set up for the need for a global leader. Am I the only one? Or is there anyone else that can say, I see what's happening with the world's economy. Because the first thing a global leader needs is a universal currency. And before you're going to get to a universal currency, you're going to have to have a collapse of the current economy. And you say, well, I didn't come to church this morning for conspiracy theories. I don't think that's conspiracy. I don't think that's ridiculous. I don't think that's pie in the sky ridiculousness. So my thought for you this morning is that the lack of a false prophet associated with any previous abominations of the temple prevent past events from being the final abomination of desolation. So I would never argue with someone if someone said that this was an abominable thing that Titus did back here in 70 AD. I would say, absolutely. And if someone said, did that bring desolation? I would say, yes, it brought desolation. The entire temple was destroyed. But the component that was missing was the presence of the false prophet who was encouraging people to worship Titus. So there are seven views out there. There are During the 70th week, there are four basic views out there. A Maccabean view which says it's all done and it happened in 164 uh, B.C. There's a dispensational view, which is the view I describe to, which says that we are currently living back here in a dispensation of the fullness of the Gentiles and that this is Jacob's trouble or Israel's trouble or this is a focus on the church. And then notice on my chart, I know it's really small, but in the three and a half years is where the Antichrist makes the covenant. There's a preterist view that is popular among some Presbyterians that says all of Revelation, for the most part, has all happened way back here and that what we're reading about is the past. And then there's a futurist view that's held by other Presbyterians and others that says, yes, there's a future, but it's not specific for Israel. Okay, that's the difference. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Again, please come back next Sunday so you can get a simple sermon. I don't know how else to explain this to you if I don't show you the important texts that, that provide clarity for us. And 2 Thessalonians is a very important one. 2 Thessalonians. Now the issue in 2 Thessalonians... Pastor Duane is that some of these Christians in Thessalonica thought that Christ had come. And they missed it. We missed it. So Paul writes to them a second letter to provide clarity. And notice right away the words. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that day of Jesus Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition." So let's talk about this falling away. Paul says, Paul says, if, 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 if the coming of Christ, if you're looking for the coming of Christ, when is Christ going to come? Before Christ will come, before we will see him come in the clouds of glory with all those that are in him to rule and reign on earth, before that happens, there's going to be a falling away first. Let's talk about this word falling away. Let me spell it for you. My pronunciation is pitiful. 
I revealed that last week with my butchering of resonate. Is it R-E-S-O-N-A-T-E? All right, great. And you don't pronounce it with an I no matter what. Okay. A, look at this word. A-P-O-S-T-A-S-I-A. Now what word do you see there? See the word apostasy. So the falling away is an apostasy. It's an apostasy. There's going to be a global apostasy. So he tells the church of Thessalonica, look for a global apostasy. When you see a global apostasy, you know the coming of Christ is near. In the United States, the fastest religion, the fastest growing religion is atheism. The fastest growing religion in the United States is atheism. More people are identifying themselves as atheists than ever before. And the percentage is growing faster than any other rate previously. Now how are you going to get to an apostasy if people are not declaring themselves as atheists? That's the step one. Apostasy, a global falling away. Now think about the world that we're living in and the degree to which if you believe in God as your creator, you are mocked. You are considered stupid. You are considered an idiot. If you believe in a creator God who made you, that is considered an uneducated position. That's just setting the conditions, folks, for a global falling away. And then what's going to happen? The man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. And we could have an entire lesson on the son of perdition. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Are you beginning to see it? Are you beginning to see that right here is when that happens? That the breaking of the covenant is the moment at which he declares, worship me as God. Now you just think about a people who have walked away from Christianity and walked away from other faiths. They're ready to worship someone. They're ready to embrace something. And so he declares himself as God through signs and wonders. A false prophet who has the same kind of power is encouraging the world to worship him. And so while it is true that the Romans deified Titus after the destruction of the temple in 7 AD, there isn't any record that Titus sat in a functioning temple and insisted that he be worshipped as God. So then he says in verse number 6, you need to know, you need to know that he or what is withholding or restraining him might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who lets or restrains will restrain until how long? Until he be taken out of the way. There are two options for here. Option number one is that this is Michael the archangel. Option number two is that this is the Holy Spirit. In either case, God removes the restraining force. And when the restraining force is removed, the restraining force is removed, the Antichrist raises up and manifests himself in all the glory that he can, encouraging all to worship him. Then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Titus did not die at the brightness of the coming of Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 14, When you see the abomination and desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not. These words were designed to provoke warning. Apparently the world will not know this global leader is the Antichrist until he breaks the covenant at the three and a half year mark. So now let's look at the rest of 2 Thessalonians and we will be done. Just a couple minutes to spare. I need to drive to this point so I ask that you stay with me.
Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth. There is a group of people that received not the truth. They received not the gospel. They received not the message of Jesus Christ. You say, how do we know that's talking about the gospel? Because the very next words say that they might be saved. There's a group of people that right now are alive today and they will not receive the truth. Just imagine that. There's someone here this morning that will not receive the truth. They are avoiding the love of the truth. They're keeping themselves from it. They're, they're, they're saying, I need to investigate this more. I need to watch for more things. I'm not ready to embrace the gospel yet that you might be saved. And notice the next words. This is so scary. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. This is so scary. This is unbelievably scary. David, I want you to consider the idea that there could be a teenager in our youth group that's refusing to receive Christ. And they're saying, I will receive Christ when I see these signs begin to happen, but not until then. I'll wait until the three and a half years. I'll wait until something's going on. I'll wait until they're sacrificing in the temple. I'll wait. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can't keep God from sending a strong delusion to you. You can't keep that from happening. The Bible says very clearly there. And with all the evilness and righteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. This is amazingly scary. This is to say, please listen this morning. This is to say that in this auditorium this morning, the 400 of us together, there could be an unsaved person here this morning. I don't know who you are, but you might be thinking in your mind, I'll wait. I'll wait and see if the preacher's right. I'll wait. We're getting close. I'll look for a one world currency. I'll look for a rebuilding of a temple. I'll look for a global leader. And then, then I'll receive Christ. I don't want to take my chances. I enjoy my unrighteousness. I enjoy my good life. I enjoy that which I'm participating in. If I see these things happening, then I'll receive Christ, but not until, because I like living like the devil. So I'll wait. I'll wait. But wait a minute. You think in your arrogance, I won't believe it. I'll be the one that doesn't believe. You think in your arrogance because I've received this teaching today that I'll know that he is not the Christ. He is the Antichrist. And you think in your arrogance you won't bow the knee. You won't bow the knee. You won't worship him. But you cannot keep God from sending a strong delusion such that you believe the lie. Now to me, if I was in your shoes, that would scare me to death. To think, to think, you've got to stay with me, please. To think, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. I mean, I can get over here and I can be close to this thing, but, but I'll resist. I won't bow to the Antichrist, I'll resist. Because I'm aware, I'm educated, I'm my own person. And so I can get right up here and look into this and check it out and then run over here and worship Christ and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ. But wait a minute. The text says that in the process of you moving up here and you don't know where you're at in this process and how close you are, that somewhere along this way, God sends a strong delusion and you believe the lie. So you, you in your intellectualism are creeping up here 
to look. And you're resistant. And you're saying, I won't bow. I, I won't worship. I know who the one true God is. I've been taught well at Brian. And you're creeping up here. And suddenly you find yourself on your knees worshiping. And at that moment that you bow the knee, your eternal destiny is sealed. It's sealed. Sealed. There's no repentance at that point. There's no forgiveness at that point. You have received a strong delusion from the Antichrist that he is God and you believed it. You were, you were tricked. You were deceived so that you believed a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Turn over Romans chapter number 1 very quickly and I'll, I'll spend one minute there but I got to get you to see this correlation and then we'll be done. And I'll, just, I'll be very quick. If you'll turn quickly, I'll read quickly. Romans chapter number 1 verse 18. If you could catch up Art and put that passage on the screen, that'd be great. I'm just going to stay right here. I won't even move around. That'll save us a little bit of time. For the wrath of God, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. These are people who suppress the truth. Because they, that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in God, so that they are without excuse. There isn't anyone in this room that doesn't understand God made you. You know in the recesses of your heart that God made you. That the invisible things have been revealed to you and you know that God made you. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful. They became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like, remember what I talked to you about in Revelation. Look at these descriptions. Birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. The parallel scares me. The parallel is unbelievable. Wherefore? God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. They changed the lie, of the truth of God into a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is unnatural. And likewise the men also leaving the natural use of women burned and lust one to another, men with men, and working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was meant even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind there it is right there I wanted you to see the parallel between 2 Thessalonians in which he sends a great delusion to Romans chapter number a reprobate mind and I want you to know that somewhere along this path between now today October 2012 and the revealing of the beast between now and this path you think that you'll just creep up here and you'll get real close and you'll be alive and you'll be watching for the signs and you'll ignore the warnings that are in the scripture about running away and avoiding it and you'll get right up here and you'll think that you'll check it out and you'll be there Johnny on the spot and you won't worship it and somewhere along this process of time God turns you over to a reprobate mind and Sean, you will not believe the gospel with a reprobate mind. You think that today is not your day of salvation, that you can wait till tomorrow or next week or next month or next year, but you don't know when you're going to receive a reprobate mind. Let's pray.